Raji. So today our speaker is Dr. Zaki Atiyah. Dr. Atiyah is an AI researcher in Mayo Clinic, Minnesota, developing AI-based medical screening tests for early detection of cardiac diseases. Three of these tests are currently in FDA approval process under breakthrough designation. As the co-director of AI in cardiology, Zaki directs a team of AI researchers working side by side with cardiologists to find effective algorithms to help patients to get the care they need as quickly as possible. Zaki received his bachelor and master degree in elect electrical engineering from Ben Gurion University in Israel and his PhD in bioinformatics and computational biology from the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Zaki. And uh, Zaki already has a number of high impact publications, first author paper in Lancet and Nature Medicine. So it's a great pleasure to have Zaki to talk with us. So uh, Zaki, take it over. Thank you very much, Hoshi, very kind of you. Uh, do you see my screen correct? Yes. Great. Uh, so thanks again for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to give a, a, a talk with people I, I know I like working with. Um, these are my disclosures. And I, I, they asked me to start about myself a bit. So as, as she said, I had a bachelor's master from Israel in electrical engineering. Then I came to Mayo uh, and kind of co-founded the AI group in cardiology. I did my PhD in the U of M and started a faculty position about almost three years ago. Um, originally from uh, Netanya, um, lovely beach town in Israel, and I currently live here. And you might ask yourself uh, who would do such a mistake, but it, it just tells you how great Mayo is and how fun it is to work here if, you, if you're willing to, to make that change to the frozen tundra. Um, I was hoping to, before diving into the use of AI in cardiology, to kind of start with some introduction, just to kind of level the playing field for everyone, and then talk about the validation of AI in the real world. A lot of it is actually Shaoxi's work, and how we use AI and develop AI as part of the clinical department in cardiology in Mayo. So as you know, AI is really everywhere in our life, from self-driving cars to when you talk to Siri, uh, it was even able to win at Go. And if you looked uh, online lately, you keep hearing about, for example, ChatGPT and the amazing progress that AI has done. But what is AI really? So when you look at the definitions, AI is technically any intelligence demonstrated by machines, anything that mimics human behavior. But when you talk about AI, we usually mean machine learning which is a subset of AI that use statistical techniques to learn how to perform a specific task. And most of these machine learning algorithms are actually deep learning, in which the AI or the algorithm learns the feature and the representation of the data by looking at a lot of example instead of by human curated features. It's important to say it's usually very narrow intelligence, even ChatGPT that looks uh, uh, so interesting and so confusing it's basically a language model, just predicts the correct right word if it was talking to a human. It also uses statistical learning. So instead of giving it data and rules and getting outcomes, we actually get to it data and outcomes and derive the rules. And you can ask yourself, how can you teach something without actually knowing the rules? Because the main issue is that, how, how do you even teach it? But we have examples from real life outside of computer science that we have the same strategy. If you haven't been to the airport and see a, a dog sniffing around you, we have no idea how a bomb um, smells like, right? We just give a dog a lot of examples of bombs and a lot of examples of benign things, and we just give it a treat every time it's right. So it learns to detect the pattern. We can teach it, but we do not know the rules ourselves. There is a lot of growth, almost exponential growth, as you can see here in the publication. This is the preprints, the peer review is uh, slightly uh, lower growth, but still there's a lot of information and a lot of innovation in this field. And you can ask yourself, why is it happening now? What's the difference? 
The main um, idea might be that we just have new algorithms that we never had before, right? Someone invented something new, but that's not the case. The main algorithm we're using is still back propagation, and it's the exact same one which Jan Lacun published in 1989, so more than 30 years ago. The main difference is, is that now we have access to data and technological resources. Data, everything we're doing is now digital. We save everything in, in clinical care. You have uh, medical reports, scanned images, ECGs. Everything you need is in available and in digital form. Outside of it, we now have tools that allow us to label data because a lot of our models require label data. You can pay people cents to do the work and just uh, crowdsource it and have millions of employees so-called working to help you label it. And in most cases, we actually label the data for free. Whenever you upload something to Instagram or Facebook and put a hashtag, now Facebook knows what's in the picture based on these hashtags. On the technological resources, we have GPUs, which is probably the biggest uh, advancement that we had. We have these are small, very simple processors that work very, very quickly and can work in parallel. They were invented to help gamers to look at video games uh, to, look, to make them look better. Right, because there you have to get every pixel on the screen updated at the same time. So companies spend millions or billions of dollars inventing these GPUs that would work in parallel. And now someone said, oh, let's just use it to train neural networks. These are the same functions, mathematical functions. But not only that, in the past, you would have to buy a GPU or a computer with GPUs with 100K or something like that. But now you can rent it by the hour. And you don't even have to learn how to code yourself. You can just buy. You, sorry, not buy, you can download for free tools like uh, Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and based your code on years of engineering time from Google and Facebook. So we do have access to amazing tools that weren't available in the past. When you think about machine learning, there are two main areas, supervised and unsupervised learning. There are other areas like reinforcement learning and generative learning, but in medicine, these are the main two ones. And usually it's supervised. In supervised learning, we give each sample or each example a label. We tell the computer what we want to see. So it can be a continuous number, which will create a regression problem, or a classification, which group this samples belong to. Is it a sick or a healthy patient? Is it a severe, moderate, or normal patient? Unsupervised learning is also useful, but usually in the end, you need a labeled data. So you can take your data and say, divide these two groups based on the, let's say if it's ECG, ECG alone. So you don't feed any labels, you just separate to two groups. But eventually, usually you need some labels to connect it to practice, right? The fact that two patients are similar or two patients are, are different is useful only if you know what that means clinically. A lot of our work was based on linear regression and linear um, logistic regression, which is basically a simple formula, but most problems in life are non-linear. And because the problems are non-linear, we required non-linear solution. And we've done it by combining a lot of simple models together. This is a neural network. Basically, each of the nodes of a neural network is a tiny regression model activated by a nonlinear activation that allows the model to learn very complex and nonlinear function and representation of the inputs. We call it neural network because it was created to mimic the human brain. This is a neuron in the brain and this is a biological neural networks connecting these neurons. And basically we switched the, uh, uh, from how fast the neuron is firing to what's the output of that set of, uh, in, uh, of input uh, nodes. We usually apply a, a, a nonlinear activation function to kind of separate it. Otherwise, if it was all being linear, it will just uh, collapse to a uh, logistic regression. So we use this uh, activation function between the layers and that allows us to learn very complex functions. In my talk today, I'm going to talk mostly about ECG. And when you think about AI ECG, you can imagine streaming human capability, which is very useful, which will be first pass interpretation, triage, scalability. But maybe more interesting is doing what humans cannot do, 
and adding value to the ECG and moving beyond just normal or abnormal. We started with ECG because it's a very simple um, signal, but it's a very good representation of the heart electrical activity. So if you put an amplifier on a myocyte or one heart cell, you would get this activation function. Now this activation might change if the heart cell is sick. When you, when you connect all of these activation functions, you get this ECG, which is usually measured from the surface. We usually use a 12 lead system, but you can use more or less leads. It's just more projection of the same heart dipole, which is three-dimensional by nature, and we take a 2D um, representation of it. And we get these two planes. Now, in the past, we would take those ECGs and convert them to human knowledge. So it would be a human engineer. Uh, by the way, that's how we started. I created a lot of features about eight or nine years ago. How, uh, what's the slope of the T wave? What's the height of the QRS? And we would take those features and feed them to a model. That can, again, be a neural network, logistic regression. But the main difference and the main advancement in the last years is that we stopped doing that. We now say, take a convolutional neural network, for example, and use that to learn the feature by itself. So now the features are being learned from the examples and are being specifically generated for the task you're uh, trying to solve. So if we look at the practical aspect of it, in the past, we would take that ECG and we would feed in the QT, the PR, the QRS. You can do it by code. You can do it by asking a clinicians to translate the ECG to, the, uh, to these features. And now we just represent it using a matrix, usually 5,000 by 12, that depends on the sampling rate, and we feed it. There's two differences. This one, these features are explainable. We know exactly what each feature represents because it's based on uh, uh, maybe hundreds of years of, of medical, more than 100 years of medical knowledge. But they might be best because we only tell the network the features that we think are, are important. There's no way to get all the features, right? You have to code them. And also they might be inaccurate because they are measured by human or by code that someone created. On the deep learning features, these are non-explainable features, but they are unbiased and they are optimized during training. So the network has access to whatever features it, need, it thinks it needs. And when we train a model detection, we feeding a lot of ECGs through the convolutional neural network and during training, we show it the label. The model output is usually a probability of the disease. It doesn't say we think the patient is sick or healthy. It says the probability is between zero to one. We usually normalize it that way. When you test, you don't show the label anymore. You take that probability, you compare it with the label and you create what's called an ROC, a receiver operation uh, characteristic curve. Just to make sure everyone knows what an ROC is, it's a way for us to know how good is a classifier. The concept is that there is a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. And you can think of the extreme cases, right? If you say everyone is healthy, you might get, uh, and you have 80% of your patients that are healthy, you get 80% accuracy, but it's useless because the sensitivity is zero uh, and the opposite is also true. So you want a model that separates the, the, uh, the two classes, and then you want to choose what is the threshold that you apply to say, this is a positive patient, this is a negative patient. And you, you can select it based on the clinical aspect because, if a positive test would mean that this patient is getting chemotherapy, you might want a very, very specific threshold because you don't want a lot of patients getting chemotherapy if they don't have to. If it's sending them to an echo, you might say, well, I'm okay with slightly higher sensitivity and lower specificity because worst, uh, worst thing happens, the patient gets an echo and he didn't need it. And if the separation of the two groups is very bad, they almost overlap with the scores. The AUC is close to 0 0.5 or a flip of a coin. If it's really good, you get something like this. Most models uh, published are between 0 0.7 to 0 0.9, right? Ones that we use all the time and, and have very poor accuracy. AUC is Chad Vest score has an AUC of 0 0.65. A lot of the stroke prediction, ASCVD prediction have around 0 0.7. 
and we still use them because they're better than random. Uh, and now we kind of covered uh, all the uh, uh, the background for it. I want to talk about uh, two specific diseases that we looked in our group. The first one is heart failure and specifically heart failure with uh, low ejection fraction. So as you know, one of the four deaths in the US is due to heart disease. Heart uh, failure, systolic heart failure or left ventricular dysfunction is responsible for one out of nine deaths. It's actually worse than most cancers because of the low um, survival rate. And it creates a lot of uh, morbidity. And it's actually a very expensive disease as well. It costs more than $30 billion in the US alone every year. The way we uh, quantify it is by looking at the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is the amount of blood pumped out in each heart cycle uh, over the amount of blood in the chamber. You can imagine that our heart doesn't uh, flat out like a pancake, right? It pushes most of the blood, but not all of it. And a normal EF is between 50 to 70%. A drop in EF might start with no symptoms, and we have known treatments to improve life quality and longevity. So it's really important to find these patients before they go up the stairs and can't breathe, right? You would want to catch them in, a, in, a, in the beginning of the disease so you can treat them and get better outcomes. The problem is that two to 9% of the population have asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction. We have a way to measure it. It's using eject, uh, echo derived ejection fracture, uh, MRI or CT, but all of these methods are slow, expensive and require a physician. So it's great for diagnosis, but it's not suitable for wide population screening. And there is an, uh, there even a heart policy network statement that says that basically patients are facing a diagnosis lottery. If you live close to a medical center that have access to an echocardiogram, you will get diagnosed earlier. If you live in a rural area, if you have less resources, you have a higher chance of developing clinical heart failure and dying. And finding a solution to this problem might actually improve health quality. This is how the EF is usually measured. And this is the signal we're actually looking at. The problem is that we know that AI, uh, sorry, a clinician cannot assess EF from an ECG. Even if you take the experts, maybe only a handful of them can look at an ECG and say, I think this patient have heart failure. ECG is just not built for it. It looks at the electrical activity and not the contractile activity. And this work was published in 2019. I just want to kind of acknowledge the whole team. It was really a big group effort. Um, we started with 600,000 patients. We cleaned the data set. We ended up with about 100,000 patients. We use about a third of them to train the model. So this is, as you remember, the uh, examples that you show the model with the labels, you use it to seed the model. And then we validated on 9,000 patients until we found the optimal model. Once we found the optimal model, just by trying all kinds of combinations of architectures, hyperparameters, how quickly it learns, how many samples you show it each time, we took 50,000 patients and use it to test our model. We used, again, a convolutional neural network. Actually, at the time, it wasn't very conventional. We took something that was built for images, and we adjusted the amount of filters and the shapes and so on to make it look at the ECG in a way similar to how a human looks at it. We looked at each lead, and then we combined the information from the lead, and we gave it a, a classification problem of does the patient's ejection fraction based on an echo done within two weeks is less or equal to 35? At some point, by the way, we, you'll see in the presentation, it sometimes goes to 40 because uh, when we got to the FDA process, we decided that 40 would be a more actionable threshold. The area under the curve we had was 0 0.93, and we had a sensitivity and specificity of 86%, which is a very, very good uh, result for a screening test especially when you compare to pap, pap smear, mammography, or even PSA. And maybe more interesting was that when you look at the patients, there are always false positive and false negatives. So when you take the patients that had a negative screening, meaning the algorithm thought they are normal, and had an EF of greater or equal to 50, so there is a margin there between the 35 to 50, and you compare them with patients that had an EF of 50, so com again, completely considered normal by uh, a human physician, 
and had an abnormal AI screening, and you compare the two, you see that if you follow up on them, the patients that have what's called a false positive actually have a much higher risk, about five times in six years, to develop low EF. So it wasn't really a false positive, it was more of an early positive. The AI ECG was able to see something that the echo cannot see because it hasn't manifested yet. And then we validated on 50,000 people, so you can ask yourself, do we need any more validation? But there are many ways to validate a model when you define and when you create an AI algorithm. The first thing we want to make sure is that there's no bias or unwanted signals. And it's important to understand that bias can come in many forms. It's not necessarily race and gender, but it definitely is the most interesting one. Example for bias can be where you have controls from one clinic. This is actually a case, uh, and a case study that people looked at when they trained the model. This is the publication. They trained controls, uh, chest X-ray to, to find pneumonia, to control from clinic A, cases from clinic B in the same hospital, they randomized them, they had training validation testing, got a 100% accuracy, which should always you know, uh, be very worrisome. You shouldn't get 100% accuracy in almost any test because there's always noise, there's data issues with the labels. And then they took it to a different hospital and there the accuracy was 50%, basically bad as a flip of a coin. Then they went back and see and tried to use all kinds of methods to show what was the model looking at. And apparently what the model was looking at wasn't the chest at all. It was looking at this marker because in one, um, in one clinic, they used uh, one type of marker. In the other, they used a different one. So there was bias in the data in the marker they used. And because of it, the model just learned that the simplest way to differentiate between a sick patient to a healthy patient is looking at that marker. So the model achieved its uh, its task, but because the features are unexplainable and this is a black box, this is something to worry about. When you think about gender and race, which are uh, really things that we want to make sure we do not emphasize inequality because of AI, you see that once a model uh, was trained, I'll, I'll show you in a second example of a model that looks at images and try to describe them via text. And there's a model that was trained with a biased uh, specifically biased data set and a model that was trained with unbiased data set. So this is a picture of an astronaut. So the biased, the unbiased model says this is a portrait of an astronaut with the American flag. A biased model that look, haven't seen any uh, female professional says this is a photograph of a smiling housewife in an orange jumpsuit with the American flag. And this is something that can propagate to our models and we want to make sure it doesn't happen. So we looked at our at the same cohort, and we looked at this testing set, and we looked what would happen if you would analyze it by race. Because as you can see here, most of male patients are actually white and non-Hispanic, and we want to make sure that we don't create a model that work only for them. Zachy, can I, can I interrupt for a second? Uh, sure. You know, bias is such an important area to get into. There, there are a couple of questions that came up in the chat. I was wondering, because you know, sometimes it can be uh, good to just kind of address some of them because I, I think others would probably be thinking of this. Sardar Ansari was asking when you were talking about performance and I believe it was in the context of like sensitivity and specificity. I think he was also asking about event rates and positive predictive values and areas under precision recall curves and things like that. Do you have any comments about that? Sure, so the incident rate, I actually mentioned it here was 9%. That was the uh, into the population and the positive and negative predictive value are actually presented here. The positive predictive value is the green bar, 33%. These are the patients with actual EF that were labeled as low EF. And the negative predictive value was 90% plus the 8.6 because these were the, uh, so it's basically 98.7% negative predictive value. Now you can also say, this is definitely a negative predictive value because these patients were not uh, be um, screened uh, further if they have uh, above low uh, EF. But even if you catch a patient from this group that have an EF between 35 and 50, it's not a wasted echo because you learn more about him and you might stop him from deteriorating even more. So in a way, the, ne the positive predictive value is anywhere between 33% to 64%. These are the only patients that you would say they are completely normal and you would send them to an echo. 
But even for those, we found that, again, they would have a much higher chance of developing low EF in the future. And I think that your point also about this is just, you know, as a screening test, right? I mean, you know, you, you, you would tolerate in some ways sometimes a, a lower positive predictive value with the goals of, of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, um, Venk, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, you I mean, you, you, you gave the perfect uh, segue into it, actually, in the sense of these people having sort of an intermediate e ejection fraction. Um, there's a conscious decision you put up, you, you showed up front about classification problems versus regression problems. Why not report it as a regression? What would the, what would the downsides have been? How accurate would that have been instead of just the, a little bit of a black box of saying below or above 35%? So the main reason we selected a, a classification problem, we obviously tested the regression as well. Uh, we found that eventually what the position is looking at is, is the number I'm getting higher or lower than that threshold? Because based on that guidelines, that's the point you would treat them, right? Now, the model wasn't great in saying your specific ejection fraction, so it might confuse 55 to 65. But if that's the case, you probably, the physician wouldn't care. What you really care is it's below the threshold that you would send for a, a, a device, you'll start giving medication and so on. And we also said, this is not going to replace echo. This is only going to say who requires an echo. So anyway, we needed a threshold, which is actually a nice segue to- in But, a but isn't there information in saying my predicted EF is 40? versus 60, right? I mean, presumably the person's got a prediction of 60 is less likely to have a, a clinically actionable EF than the person who's predicted to be 40 or 42 or something like that, right? So, so we'll show in a second how we actually present it because even when it is normalized to a probability, we still present that probability. Um, so sorry, I'm just kind of going back to the... Um, and we'll address it in a second. Just going to the race again. So you can ask yourself, why do you even care about race? Because we only fed in an ECG. We never told the, the model if it's a male or a female, if it's a, a, a black or white person. And it seems like the model can actually, if you train a model to detect your race from an ECG, it can do it. Meaning that there are uh, features in the ECG that tells the model what's safe, and it can base its decision based on it. But we checked, and for all of these models, uh, it seems like the model, the AUC was very high. So we showed that at least this specific model, it does mean that all models will be that way, is insensitive to the patient trace. We also looked at how would it work on a stethoscope. This is a study we've done in the clinic, meaning that it's you know, its quality is much higher than you would get uh, usually because it's done by a study coordinator. And we got a very, very good AUC showing that you can use a single lead, um, which was very, again, promising. Just want to show you a couple of cases. So this is a case of the first patient that had his 35 year old male, he presents after his sister dies suddenly, gets an ECG and the ECG is reading normal sinus rhythm, normal ECG. We run it through the AI, the AI say low EF, 76% probability of having low EF. And that's important because we do show how certain we are, and that correlates very well with the predicted EF of the model. So when you, as a physician, see that the patient have a 76% chance, you might treat it differently than 40%, if, even if the threshold is 35. He gets an echocardiogram, he has an EF of 18, and he's waiting for a transplant. So, Zaki, does this, uh, does this like hit at Venk's point? So, you might have said 76% chance, but that probably means that the EF that was estimated by that model might have been on the lower end. Not, not right. Just, That's okay. the probability of you having low EF, and as, as it's higher, there is a chance of higher, of lower ejection fraction, but mm -hmm. it doesn't completely linearly correlate. And when you get to Eagle, we'll see that that was probably the easiest way for clinicians to also integrate that information to their decisions. Hey, Zaki, there is a third question uh, in the chat. So Andrew Williams asked, how did the indication for ECG and comorbidity profile for patients labeled as healthy compared to patients labeled as having heart failure in the training data? Yeah, so for the training data, we did not look at 
the uh, reasons for an ECG. We just took anyone who had an ECG and echo. We did take the we did take the earliest pair per patient. So hopefully most of those patients who are early stage of heart failure are not patients with uh, severe and old heart failure. Uh, the exact comorbidity profile is in the paper, but they are obviously a more a morbid group of patients, more hypertension, more diabetes, and so on. All of the causes of that case. Uh, but even when we tested it on subgroups of patients and kind of normalized by matching, we still got a very good AUC. So we believe we are actually detecting the low EF and not the comorbidities. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Um, so you, your, your, your sample is patients who had an ECG and uh, EF within two weeks of each other. Yes. Um, but then depending on how you use this model, I'm assuming you want to screen uh, a broader set of patients, so anyone who has an ECG, does the results generalize to that group? Because I'm assuming I'm not being a, car a cardiologist or a clinician, uh, I don't know where the bias is, but I'm assuming that that group probably looks different than a lot of other patients who get an, just an ECG without an EF. Correct. And, and you'll see that in most of our validation studies, we actually uh, looked at, uh, and it's a great question. You know it's a great question because in a few slides, I'm going to answer it. So, okay. uh, um, but basically, while it's oversampled in a way, because patients in this case had a higher prevalence of low EF than um, because they got an echo for some reason, even when we use an ECG alone, we still got very uh, useful results. I might skip some of these. We tried to improve the AI model by adding age and sex. Uh, it didn't really help. And we asked ourselves, maybe it can guess it. And we looked at the ability of AI ECG to detect age and sex. And we had very, very good results. You see of 97. So it's basically almost perfect test for detection patient sex. And we did the regression model for age and we got some errors. And we found that these errors are actually correlated with the patient's comorbidity as overall health. Uh, this is an example that uh, some of you might have seen in the past, but the patient that started when he was 30 and looked like he's 55 only got older and suddenly got much younger. Uh, usually I ask the people, and, and some people guess he stopped smoking, starting exercise, but the hard truth is that he got a heart transplant. He literally got a younger heart and then suddenly looks better. His comorbidity actually improved. His diabetes got into remission. His hypertension was treated. So we really hope that the AI ECG is a good marker uh, for detecting the uh, patient overall health. Another, um, and we, we will go into the validation models of the EF uh, in a second, but I just kind of want to also look at a different type of disease, uh, AF for preventing stroke. So we know that if you have atrial fibrillation, your heart quivers, it can cause, can send um, from the left appendage uh, small, uh, particles that can lodge in your brain and create stroke. Uh, problem is that AF is sometimes asymptomatic and it's very hard to screen for because it requires uh, long-term monitoring. And if you have atrial fibrillation and you, if, sorry, if you had a stroke that you don't know the reason for, what's called a cryptogenic stroke, if you had AF, you would get anticoagulants. If you didn't have AF, you would get aspirin. And the reason for uh, why um, you had it really impact your uh, future care. As I mentioned, the ways to scan it now, there are, you can use a watch, you can use a patch, you can use a phone, but the gold standard is actually making a uh, recording all the time using a loop recorder, which is a very expensive uh, way and, and invasive. And we know that the yield goes up as you monitor for longer periods of time. So we asked ourselves, can we take the same approach of the ejection fraction model and just show the model ECGs that are currently in normal sinus rhythm and label them based on if the patients ever had atrial fibrillation or in the past or in the near future. So again, all the ECG were normal sinus rhythm. You show them to a human expert, you would say this is a normal patient, but we label them based on their past or, or future. This was published again in, in 2019 in Lancet as well. 
um, use the same concept, slightly more complex uh, model with uh, residual blocks, just because we had more ECGs. We had about a million ECGs in this work. And the AUC was again 0 0.87 and 0 0.9 if you go to two um, ECGs per patient on average. This goes to a lot of your question, how can we validate and see if it really affects patient care, right? One of the reasons you might want to do it is the patient populations that we looked at are biased. These are groups of patients that have got an echo, for example, or have got enough ECGs that we know that they have AF, and we want to see will it work in the real, in, in practice. So uh, this is a paper that actually Dr. Yao presented in Nature Medicine with Dr. Nosworthy, looking at a cluster randomized pragmatic design to detect patients with low EF. And the really innovative uh, part is that they looked at randomizing clinicians and not patients. So basically half of the patient, half of the clinicians got access to the AI results and half did not. And we wanted to see with the patients, with the clinicians that use AI have better chance of detecting new low EF uh, um, based on the ECG and would they send the patients to an echo? This is how the results look like. At the beginning, we only showed positive or negative results. We did not show the score because uh, I think, uh, and, and we can, uh, in the question section, maybe talk to Dr. Rao about why exactly they chose this way. It was through a lot of research. These are the indications for um, getting an ECG. But as you can imagine, none of them was to detect low EF. And the primary findings of this study is that the intervention increased the uh, diagnosis of new low EF uh, cases in 32% from 1.6% to 2%, because this is again, a general practitioners, these are not cardiology patients, that's the, why the prevalence is much lower than our echo group but this was significant. The AUC was very similar to the AUC of the development group. And another interesting uh, concept is we asked ourselves, well, did the patients that had, did the clinicians that have access to AI used more echocardiograms? Because it's not really fair if because of that, or you just order more echoes. And that was not the case. There wasn't a significant difference between the amount of uh, echoes done in both groups. So AI-ECG led to just a better selection of who would receive an echocardiogram. You ask about how we present the data. So we have, we've created internally an AI dashboard that shows clinicians how uh, their patient's ECG change over time. So it gives them all of the basic information, the uh, rhythm, heart rate, um, QT and so on, but also shows them the scores. Now the scores, even though they are normalized to a probability between zero to one, and they are um, colored in a dichotomized way between red and blue, abnormal, normal, you can still see that there's a difference between this sample to this one. And that's the concept. We wanted to normalize that all of our results will look the same. So we won't say estimated EF, probability of AF because most of these diseases are actually binary or multi-class by nature. Uh, and this is the ejection fraction. It's been used about half a million times in Mayo Clinic in the last two years. And we are now trying to get it to other hospitals. We then said, can we take it even further? Can we use a mobile form factor like a watch and uh, run the AI and detect low EF using the watch. And for that, we needed a lot of patients. And we weren't sure if we can recruit and, and keep them uh, engaged and allowing them to send data. Um, we use the Apple Watch. The main reason we use the Apple Watch is just because the Apple Health Kit allows you to get access to the raw digital data, which we needed for the analysis. We actually feed in the raw voltages. And we did a study completely in a digital form. We just sent emails and with a survey asking, do you have an iPhone with a watch? If you have it, would you be willing to participate in the study? If they said yes to both questions, we'd send them a DocuSign, PTRAX consent form, allowing them to consent to our study. Once they consented, we sent them an app, which was created uh, with the Center for Digital Health in Mayo, that allows them to upload all of their Apple Watch ECG to our universal data platform and to our dashboard. 
The nice thing is that clinicians can now look at their patient's ECG, and if a patient calls in or send them a, a note, they can scroll in and see what was the results from the latest ECG. We uh, wanted to see if we can use our AI ECG model, but there's two problems. One, it's not a 12 lead, obviously. And second, the ECGs themselves look very different. It's not a 12 lead anymore, but it also, as you can see here, much smoother. This is a patient who had two ECGs within 15 minutes, 12 lead and an Apple Watch. And the ECG morphology is similar, but also very different. The Apple Watch really smooths out the signal to look better but it also hides some of the information by doing so. So what we've done is we took our original cohort and mimicked uh, an Apple Watch tracing. We took lead one, we filtered it in a similar way and retrained the model. When we retrained the model, we got an AUC of 0 0.88, so a drop, but that makes sense because you have less information. It's only a single lead, plus you remove a lot of the high frequency signals. We recruited 100 and, uh, sorry, 2,400 patients and collected 125,000 ECGs from 46 states and 11 countries. Uh, patients' ages were uh, between, uh, average of 53 plus minus 15, but the younger patients were 21 and the oldest patients were 91. And we had very high engagement. Uh, what was really surprising is that we also find a, a correlation between the patient age positive correlation between the patient age and the engagement. So the older patients actually engaged with the app more and uploaded more ECG. We sent a notification every two weeks and patients uh, actually connected about eight times over the five uh, months. So every other week um, on average. From the 2,400 patients that we had, we had 420 patients with an echocardiogram. And for those patients, we analyzed uh, the model once with a single ECG, which is closest, and 10 ECGs on average around one month of the echocardiogram. We're thinking about the fact that there's a trade-off because these ECGs are uh, lower quality. Maybe we can use more of them uh, because it's also easier to record than a 12 lead ECG. About 16 patients, 16 patients, sorry, had EF of uh, 40 or below. The AUC was 0 0.885, so very similar to our internal cohort. Um, and we had a sensitivity and specificity of 81%. We did not see any significant difference between using a single ECG or the mean score from uh, roughly 10 ECGs. And we believe that's because the ECG we selected were already high quality. We rejected any ECGs that had low quality determined by the Apple Watch. So for summary, we, we recorded uh, for 46 states, uh, received 125,000 ECGs and applied uh, the May watch. We going back to the AF model, we want to see if we can take a, a normal sinusoidum ECGs, look at the AI and detect if the patients have AF. And we have a very nice case of a patient that had many ECGs over the years. She uh, comes to Mayo with her first strokes in 2014, uh, sorry comes again with a second stroke in 2020. Uh, at that time, we did not know if she has AF or not, but looking at the dashboard, we thought that she might have it. We followed up on her and she actually had her first AF in 2000, about a few months after the first stroke. But based on the AI algorithm, she has atrial fibrillation for at least 15 years. And you can ask yourself, if we would use this model in 2015, could we eliminate the second stroke? So to answer this question, Dr. Yao and Oswaldi again created a very exciting study, sending patients uh, that had abnormal AI-AF screening um, and controls matched to them by risk factors, age, and sex, uh, a patch to uh, monitor them uh, for 30 days uh, and see if they actually have AF. This is a case of one of our first patients in the study which had a very, very high uh, score of AF, but never diagnosed with AF, and had many, many ECGs, but all of them are sinus rhythm. Two days after he enrolled in the study and get the patch, gets diagnosis with atrial fibrillation, get uh, a virtual meeting with a physician, get anticoagulation, and so on. There's another case that uh, of administrator that actually decided to go forward and, and, went, and was interviewing with STAT. You can find that article and read more about it. Um, 
but it seems like um, I'll skip that. It seems like the AI ECG can really see things that human uh, miss. And again, it will not replace physicians, but it would definitely give them kind of superpowers and can help them treat patients better and detect diseases in earlier stages. I want to leave some um, time for questions. I'll just maybe a couple of more minutes I want to, because I, I know I'm talking to a group of uh, um, similar researchers and clinicians to, to Mayo. So I, want to kind of tell how we're doing the AI team in our group. So we have our AI team as part of the innovation group in cardiology. The innovation group has four uh, arms, uh, virtual reality, pharma and biologicals, medical devices, and AI, which I co-direct with Dr. Francisco Lopez. Uh, and we have AI engineers currently in signals and computer vision. Um, engineers, especially when they come to Mayo, but they have an opportunity, and most of them are on the, uh, the call actually, uh, have an opportunity to join, see cases, learn more about it. One of our engineers did an ECG uh, read them course. Uh, they can go and, and see all the procedures and really understand better what the physicians are trying to solve and how to help patients better. We also have a lot of fun. This is the group. I uh, really want to acknowledge everyone that it's really a group effort. Um, and it's really a, a nice mix of uh, physicians and AI engineers working together. Um, and I think that's really the key to make sure that we create models that are useful, uh, uh, done correctly from an engineering standpoint, but can actually have impact on patients. And I want to thank all of them for, for their work in, in creating all of the uh, um, models that we presented uh, today. I uh, want to, tell, to thank you for uh, listening and uh, please reach out if you uh, are interested in learning more about it. Uh, and maybe I'll leave some, we have about 10 minutes for questions, I think. Thank you very much hey, again. Thanks, Zaki. So there are a few questions in the chat. So I assume Van's, Van's question is related to the AI AFib algorithm, right? So he asked how many people would have additional be indicated for anticoagulation. So if this is referred to the trial, we, uh, we select patients who would be qualified for anticoagulation if AFib would be detected. So the patients not only have a high AI ECG score, but also need to have a chest vest two for men, three for women. And we exclude those who have end-stage renal disease and intracranial bleeding. So basically we expect uh, these people um, should be already, uh, should, should be in indicated for anticoagulation if a fib were to be detected. And David has two questions. For Zaki, so one is your sample. Uh, your samples are enormous and much larger than I have been seeing with imaging studies. So how do you know how to power your study? And the second is using the Apple Watch wearing population is a particular low risk group and the similar uh, ROC might yield many false positive compared to clinic obtained ECGs. Is this consistent with what you found? So that's a great question because patients, um, as the patients got gets deeper and deeper into the clinical screening, they are, they obviously have a higher chance of having the disease, right? If patients have an echo, it's in high risk in a patient that only have an ECG, and they're in high risk in a patient that have an Apple Watch that they got for uh, different reasons for tracking their steps and so on. So. The concept we were thinking is that as you go to a simpler form factor, you will need a higher threshold and more samples, meaning you might need, instead of a single ECG that is positive, you might want to say, oh, this patient is consistently getting many Apple Watch ECGs that are positive. Then we'll invite them to a 12 lead ECG. And then only uh, based on that higher quality test decide on an echo. So it's not that we would get uh, treatment for uh, low EF from the Apple Watch, right? It's kind of a stepwise approach, but we are getting access to more patients that might not even get a 12 lead ECG. Uh, and by, by doing so, maybe reaching out to patients who are in rural places. And it, Apple Watch originally sounded very kind of expensive, chic, maybe for higher um, 
social economic state, but it's actually cheaper than having uh, many of the tests we we're talking about doing done once, right? An Apple Watch can cost, if you go to Best Buy and buy a later version, you can buy it in 150 bucks or 200 bucks. It's roughly the cost of an Apple, uh, of a, sorry, 12 lead ECG. And if that works, you can imagine a rural clinic using that as their mini ECG device, right? Doing it, and only if they get consistently positive or, or should I say abnormal results, only then decides to move to the next step. Yeah, and Zaki's trial is the pioneer first trial, and we are starting another trial now, just like for those who do not have an Apple, Apple Watch or phone, we'll give them a watch and phone. So we are no longer limiting to the population with uh, Apple Watch. So hopefully uh, the results will be more generalizable. Any other question or any follow-up questions? From I saw a question about the toxicity of anticoagulation. So it's oh, again, the, yeah. it's important to say that all of these models at this step are only built as a screening tool, meaning that we are only saying we recommend the following test or not. We are not giving any treatment directly for these models. I think we would require a lot of um, evidence that they provided benefit. Maybe some treatments, you know, we can think about them in earlier stages, but I think in all of the algorithms that we have now, a positive outcome would be, or abnormal screening result would yield a diagnostic test. So if you're positive by the AFNSR, you would get a holder or a patch to, to wear or a link recorder. You'll get something that confirms that you have atrial fibrillation and only then you would get anticoagulation. Zaki, this is a uh, Bramaji again. You know, um, thank so, you. Can for, I just uh, ask a, I, oh, I don't mean to interrupt Bramaji, but I just want to ask a follow up on my um, question, which I don't think Zaki addressed, and and it has to do with you know you, you were looking at samples of like sixty thousand ECGs or something like that, and it's rare that we're able to assemble samples uh, sizes that large, and I'm wondering if one of the reasons that you were so successful is that you had these huge samples. I'm wondering, did you look at when performance plateaued in terms of like, in other words, you had 60 samples, 60,000 samples or however many you, you had, would 10,000 have been enough to get decent performance or 15,000 or 20,000? Um, you know, right now I'm trying to put together an imaging study and I'm working with people and they say, oh, a thousand CT scans is, is a lot. And I'm like, well, it doesn't sound like a lot to me. Right. And uh, so could you speak about, you know, in this sure. field, how you think about those things? So there's definitely power in numbers and we're very fortunate to work in Mayo and have access to all of that data. That's definitely a big driver of the program success. We have looked at smaller data set and it really depends on the signal you're trying to find, right? When you have a very strong signal, you need less samples for the model to find it. Uh, when you have, uh, for example, in HCM, we had much, many, uh, much less patient, positive patients than in the EF because the signal was just stronger. We looked at looking using half of the data, a quarter of the data, eighth of the data, and going forward. And at the numbers we are at, even if you use about half of the data, you get almost the exact, almost the same, not the exact uh, AUC, but it does get. Uh, uh, better by a few points, but because we had access to all of the data, we want to make sure we use all of it. The second thing is you might have good results using a small data set, but you're not certain how well they would generalize, right? So I think it's more important to consider do you have external data sets that you can use for validation rather than just having more of your own patients and testing on more of your own patients? Because at some point, I think above 2,000 patients that you're testing on, the error margin becomes less than half a percent or so. I, Ricky Carter can answer these questions better than I do, but the, the results get, it, it becomes very, very uh, powerful and clean. The question becomes how generalizable your model is to cohorts that you have not seen before. I would try using the biggest sample that you can support just because you have access to it or because your GPU can support it. 
Um, I don't see a, a reason to train on smaller data sets unless you, you have to. Yeah, you know, I, 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 just, I mean, there's an issue with costs and the data is not ours. And it's just a lot of, is there any literature either you or Shaoxi or others on the call know of that addresses this that could help inform like a- There, there are methods, um, some we've created, some created by those that look at the way to select the data. So not all data created equal, right? Sometimes you have samples that are very similar, so they don't really contribute additional information. Uh, so I would look at uh, smart ways to sample data. I think um, uh, from UCSF, there was a work on okay. doing it in Excel. follow up maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Brahmaji. No, no, no. That that's great. Actually, I think we we've reached the end of the hour. It it is fascinating, David. I'll I'll send you. This was more with structured data elements, but there's a paper we published in CQO about like you know the like you know it was a, a study that looked at how much the addition of of more and more data actually changed uh, um, some of the results of a prediction model. But I th I think Zachy, the question I was going to ask just because there was some time just to get your thoughts on. You know, and it does dovetail into that. You know, we're starting to understand with these foundation models that maybe there is, you know, like, you know, I think there was this thought that, like, oh, after maybe hundreds of millions or even billions of parameters, there wasn't some kind of, you know, additional benefit. But now these models are getting to like trillions and they're beyond the scope of anything we even have in healthcare. But I don't know if you have thoughts about how these foundation models might be used and is there any relevance because it, it and again I'm not a you know engineer or computer scientist but it sounds like they are breaking you know some of the rules around like you know even using convolutional neural networks they're just like approaching you know some of these imaging problems and large language problems in, in a different way are you guys doing that or thinking about those large language models and foundational models in any of your work in AI? So we do look at the at the same technology, so the fusion and things that drive these models, transformers, but we have not looked at, at using those models directly because they are more most of them are focused on language. That's the big uh, the big models. There are vision transformers and so on, but they are usually not meant for medical imaging. So we're looking at the algorithms technology, not the trained models. But I'm certain, especially if you are working in unstructured data, looking at patient records, clinician notes, that these models will be very, very useful in the future. Uh, and they are doing amazing stuff. They, they, they're really advancement because, they, but they also require a, a lot of resources to train unless you have access to them already, right? You, models that are created by OpenAI, so cost probably, I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars to train and how much time, but but it's above our resources anyway. No, thank you. So thanks, Shaoshi. I don't know if you yeah. want to clean that up. So there is a, uh, one, one last question. I think I can quickly an answer. We did try add clinical data to it, but, but I don't think it improved the performance. So Zaki, the question is, if we add non-ECG fe features uh, available in clinic, does it improve uh, performance? But I think you, you try labs and other di diagnosis codes. But right. The yeah, so, we did not. So, yeah. So the power of our AI ECG is a single image that you do not need to pull those diagnosis co co codes and labs because they are missing, right? So in Mayo might not have a complete history of all the patient's past medical records. So this is a sing sing single ECG can predict the, the outcome. Correct. Okay. Thanks, Zaki, and thanks, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity and thanks for listening. Great job, guys. Thank you.